Jimmy Santiago Baca was 20 when he began five years of incarceration behind the walls of a brutal Arizona prison. He'd been abandoned as a child, placed in an orphanage, and was in and out of trouble before then. But Mr. Baca was mostly illiterate, but in prison he learned to read and discovered poetry. Now one of New Mexico's most celebrated writers, he has published volumes of poetry, essays, stories, and novels. He also works with inmates and at-risk youth to help them find their voices in writing. Mr. Baca sat down with NMIF correspondent Megan Kamerick. Jimmy Santiago Baca, thank you so much for coming to New Mexico in Focus. Thanks for inviting me. What was the first book that really opened up the world of reading for you? The first book, um, well, um, the dictionary. I mean, I used to be able to take one word. When I, it's not a difficult thing to read and write, to learn to read and write in several months. It's not hard. You just have to have a, a purpose for it. And a, a lot of the kids today in schools, they don't have a purpose to learn how to use language. So it ultimately becomes weaponized and stuff. But that wasn't my case early on. It was later. But early on, I just took one word. And I, it's, it was split up with uh, phonetically, you know, how you sound it. And then it had the Latin roots, the Greek roots, and it just went on and on and on. And if you just take one word and you follow it, you'll never stop. It'll, it'll end, uh, you'll end up with one word. You'll end up uh, studying every word in the dictionary because every single word ultimately ends up connected in reference to another word. So I started with one word and I never stopped. That was my first one. It triggered so many memories. But the first book I read when I was actually capable of reading a full sentence and then capable of focusing on a paragraph and then capable of, of, con of uh, comprehending a page and then capable of understanding the entire chapter was Turgenev. Uh, well, the first oh, one. The Russian writer? Yeah, mm -hmm. but the first one was the romantic, uh, the uh, 19th century romantic poets Shelley, Byron, Coleridge, Wordsworth, people like that. Um, I wrote in uh, Working in the Dark, this one of my earlier books, that when I first read Wordsworth's essay on Language of the Common Man, I, I, I assumed, I read it in a county jail when I was facing extradition charges to Arizona. Um, 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 I thought that Wordsworth was a gang name. I a thought, gang name? Yeah, I thought his mom gave him like, word up. We used to like, always like, you know, word up. I thought Wordsworth, hey, what's up, Wordsworth? <laughs> Somebody who uses, you know, who likes to use words. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought it was a gang name. And then I, I, I later on, some, I let some guy later on embarrassed me by saying, no, you idiot, it's an English poet's name. Wordsworth <laughs> is his real name. I said, really? Okay. That's kind of a cool interpretation of his name, though. Well, that's how I actually applied my learning, uh, like a verb. If you ask a child a day in school how he learns a verb, it's very abstract. It's action, it's movement and stuff like that. I actually looked around the prison and, and say, hey, flaco. It's like, what? So you're the fastest guy I've ever seen fight on the yard. I mean, I've never seen anybody be able to light a cigarette, kick the door jam on top twice, plus grab a fly flying around your head and still land on two feet. You know what you are, bro? What? You're a verb. And you are like serious action, homie. He's like, is that bad or good? I said, that's, that's really good, dude. Because <laughs> that's how I remember what a verb was. And then I applied other uh, nouns, a person, place, or thing, right? And I... I, I I uh, attached that, applied that to uh, Gamboa. He, he, was, he was all of 780 pounds. I said, Gamboa, you are like a really healthy noun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're like a really good noun, dude. What's a noun? It's a person. <laughs> what was education like for you when you were a kid? None. None? It was all emotion. I mean, I didn't know how to understand or interpret trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have an uncle that likes to get drunk and beat the heck out of everybody. I didn't know how to, I didn't know what the roots were, what the cause was, what the, if, I didn't know any of that. I didn't know, I, all I knew is that the person getting beat up felt terror. And the person doing the beating was caught in a trap that was trying, he was trying to release himself from. And all I, all I was able to do was to approach it emotionally. And, and, and deep inside of me, I wanted to understand how do I get this person to a place that's a good, safe place? Even if it was an adult or if it was a bum sitting on the corner playing harmonica or 
some beautiful woman in the corner of a cafe crying or something. How do I get that person to a place with language? Um, it just, it, it, it haunted me. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, uh, I didn't know, I thought language had power, but I, I never dreamed in a million years that it was the kind of power that would exude itself once I learned how to use. I know you've said that reading saved your life. How? Well, you know, for the longest time, you know, growing up, you don't, you're not very literate. So you have to fight. That's the only way you can explain yourself, you know. You explain yourself. It wasn't that I was a good fighter or a bad fighter. I was really, really good, though. I don't know, you know, <laughs> I only got beat up once, and that was by four cops. But uh, um, when you don't have language, your only response to the world is to try to force your opinion on somebody through violence. You fight, you know. If somebody says, what's wrong with you? You don't answer nothing. You stare him back. Mm. It, you give him the challenge. Throw the gauntlet down and let's see what's wrong with me, you know. That's what's wrong with me. You asking me a question, which is, which is what's wrong with me. And once you had language, you're like, are you having a, what kind of day are you having that you would ask me a question like that? It has, does it have to do something with your childhood and the time that your mother left you under the bunk when she went out to find some heroin? Is that why you're doing this to me right now? Because if that's the problem, you can sit down with me because I had the same kind of mom and we can talk. And the guys are like, what the hell? I made so many friends. I had a white racist nationalist Nazi come up to me and say, um, because I was really good at writing poetry. And he says, um, you're writing poetry for everybody, right? And I kind of look at him and I'm like. This is in prison? Yep. Mm -hmm. I say, well, you know, 25 years institutionalized, you know? So I'm, 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 I'm writing, right? So I'm from the age of five to 30, right? Society refused to let me out of the, out of its clutches. Because, I mean, there was, I must have been the most valuable kid in the world because everybody kept wanting to keep me because they were getting all kind of money for me, right? And uh, so the guy says, all right, uh, you wrote, so it's Mother's Day. Can you write me a poem? I said, yeah, no, it's no problem. But I charged him five times what I charged anybody else because of his Nazi affiliation, right? So I charged him five cartons of camels instead of just one. And I started writing about his mom and, mom, you know, just any mom, generically. And... Uh, Holy mackerel, man, I went, into this, I went into this subconscious landscape where I was five years old on a bed with my mother feeling her toes and smelling the hem of her skirt and it smelled like prairie sage and, and feeling her ankles and, and caressing her feet on an afternoon in Estancia or Willard or Tahike, you know, in a little... Co- I wrote all that. And I just, you know, and when he came to my cell, I said, here. He said, no, you read it, because he didn't want to say he didn't know how to read, so he said, you read it. So I said, all right. So I began to read it, and his knuckles started turning white. And it was a real white, because he was pretty white himself, so these knuckles were really white with rage, right? Mm. You know what he said to me that I'll never forget? How does a Mexican know what's in a white man's heart? Wow. When he said that to me, I looked at him. And I realized in that moment that language had the power to change the world. Not my fists, not violence, not guns. Words had the power to change the world because here's this Nazi who hates Mexicans. Even had it tattooed on his arm. And he says to me, how is it possible that you know what's in my heart? Wow, I told him, dude. And I gave him the, poem, the, po- the letter to his mother. And the next day when I went out in the yard, Every white boy on the yard was saying, hey, brother, hey, brother, hey. <coughs> Even my own Chicano homies were looking at me saying, what's up with all this? I said, I, I wrote them a letter, man. They're like, serious, bro? And all these people give you all this props and respect now? I'm like, yeah. So that's when I realized, you know. But there are some people immune from even that type of honesty. Because the next thing I did was write a poem to a judge telling him how innocent I was and that I needed to be released. How'd that go? It didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote me back with everything earmarked in red and said, don't ever write me again. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you know? What, why did poetry in particular speak to you when you first started learning to read? Emotion. Mm. Emotion. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't tutored in questioning authority. And uh, uh, language, I mean, uh, classroom... Uh, Lesson plans and curriculum, it's all authoritative at its root. It, you, someone tells you who has the authority to tell you what to do, and you do it. And you, you learn how to read or write and so forth and so on. And not so with emotion. Uh, when you write poetry, 
it wasn't it wasn't the lexicon nor was it the grammar nor was it anything else nor was it the the lineage of poetry or the history of it it was it was the strength of the emotion trying to get to what you wanted to say and so i began to use language and curve the words i, I began to curve it to chicanismo to chicano language I began to take the prairie, and, and through my own unique perspective, I was able to, in the heat of my emotion, I was able to bend the words so that it reflected what I felt about it. And when I did that, I would then come out into the world after being cocooned in a, po in a poem for a couple of days. I would be able to come out. And uh, it was like an enhancement or an enthrallment when I came out of that place. I was energized and I felt strong and I felt centered and I felt fulfilled. And everybody began to, everybody began to be attracted to that magnetism of language. Everybody around me started hanging out with me. Everybody started following me. Everybody started wanting to know about what I was thinking and everybody wanted to know if I had a solution to some of their problems. And it, it acted as a, as a pivotal uh, fulcrum or a, a pivotal epicenter where it affected every aspect of my life. Learning how to read and write affected every aspect of my life from the time I woke up to the time I, even in my dreams, I used to dream poetry. You saw really horrific things in that prison. It was very brutal. How did writing help you deal with that kind of violence? Sensitized me to, it sensitized me to the awful horrors, uh, the agony that people live with day to day. It just made me realize people live in agony. Uh, and you know, and that's one of the beautiful things about being, look, I was institutionalized for 25 years. I've been out almost 33, 34. And uh, one of the most beautiful things, and it's, people are, they're very, very modest and humble in many, many ways. And I feel for them in a lot of ways because 90% they, they, of the people just dedicate their lives to a company and it's, you know, it's just, it's a terrible sacrifice to have to give up your life like that so early. And they call it getting a degree and they call it going to school and all that, but it's all corporate tyranny, right? But anyway, um, um, one of the things about being ostracized from society and one of the things about being exiled from the norms and so forth and so on is that you're so happy being rebellious. I mean, I mean, look how happy those kids are in the streets when they're uh, protesting guns and the madness of owning guns. Listen, I've, I've, got, I've got 19 bullets in my body right now as I sit here and talk to you. I'm a poet who's been shot. And, and, uh, and this, is how I, this is how I interpret that. I go get an MRI once. I'm in that machine and it goes through me and the woman comes out. I've just got my underwear on and the woman comes out and she says, are you sure you don't have any uh, diamond rings or something? I said, no. Necklace? Said, no. Well, w these things keep showing up on your x-rays. And it's a black background. You've seen x-rays. Mm -hmm. It's a black background. And it had these beautiful little white bursts of, of gray. And I looked up and I said, oh, no, that's Jimmy's night sky. That's, that's, that's the place I dream. That's, that's the galaxy. <laughs> she says, well, what are they? She says, they're, I said, they're bullets. They're all little stars. There are, there's someone's hatred that wanted, they hated themselves so bad that they wanted to end my life. And they became stars in my, in my heaven. And because uh, I'm alive. And I was able to take that and then I was able to transmutate it into a poem for them or something. You know, that's Jimmy's heaven. And she looked at me and she says, God, you're weird, dude. <laughs> I said, I know, <laughs> but don't worry about it. I said, it's all good. When uh, you were in prison, you were thrown in isolation a many, lot, and it was times, totally yeah. dark right. for weeks. And you learned to take your mind somewhere else. I just sublimated the, you know, the spirit. How did that inform how you wrote? Oh, it informed everything. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I love poetry so much that it has totally screwed my, myself up in <laughs> so many ways, because it is, when you're given such extreme freedom, it limits you in the mundane things of life. I mean, you can't just write a normal sentence. You want to you wanna add like 30,000 things to the normal sentence. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like, you know, you're a straight F student here because <laughs> there's just too much that comes out, right? So it took, me a, it took me ages and years to train my mind to write a simple sentence that didn't have poetry in it because the poetry was so, it was so effulgent. It was so overwhelming and brimming in my just ordinary breathing that uh, the... the and I, and, I, and, I, and I love it and I honor it. 
and I didn't for many years. Okay, you're, you're, you're dealing with a true outlaw who was on the road doing drugs, drinking, womanizing. I, I mean, the whole nine yards, you know? And there's nobody worse than I was, nobody. And there's nobody more applicable to, to coming into this sanctum called life and humbly bending my head and saying, thank you for allowing me to live another day, because that's where I'm at. Uh, but there's more prisons. When I was at Yale teaching, mm -hmm. I held a Wall Stevens chair. There was more, more of those kids uh, in, my room, in my class, graduate students in my class, uh, were in a deeper prison that they probably would never be able to get out of. In what way? Than all the prisons I was in physically. Well, they were all in that class and every single one of them was an heir to a fortune. And they would ask me qu really weird questions like, you think, you know, my, they would tell me my dad got really mad at me and threatened not to give me my inheritance. You think he's going to do that? And I said, no, of course not. He's, he'll give you your 200 million. You really think so? I know so, man. Don't worry about that, you know. Everything hinged upon their existence uh, mattered only through the, through the focal point of how much money they had. Mm. Every single one of them. And so I quit. I said, I'm not, you know, I, after the fifth year, I said, I can't do this, or the third year, whatever it was, I can't mm -hmm. do this. And uh, um, uh, I left New Haven, went to New York, um, had a big party with all the, a lot of the faculty from Yale, we just had a great time. And then um, I came back to the South Valley. I distributed this book, Martin and Meditations on the South Valley, that just won the American Book Award and gone into its 18th printing. And uh, it was about the people in the South Valley. I still in print after all these mm -hmm. like 30 years or whatever, but I took Martin and Meditation on South Valley, handed it to everybody, and as I sat around the fire, una pachanga para los chicanos, we would all hang out and just hang out. Almost a lot of them came up to me and said, Jimmy, what's that word? Oh, that, that's, and I would tell them, then another one, Santiago, what's this word here, you know? And then someone would say, is this my poem? I said, yeah, that's you. And they would say, well, you got it wrong, hombre, you got it wrong. I don't smoke cigarettes, bro. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh my God, I put down you smoke. He says, yeah, no, you got to change that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay. But it made me realize, what am I doing at Yale when the, the, uh, the, the illiteracy in the South Valley is so high with the, with, the people, with the barrio and the people I grew up with that I immediately, next morning, I went to St. Anne's, mm -hmm. asked the priest, can I have a barracks back there? He said, absolutely. I said, great. I had my first writing workshop that night. That was 42 years ago. I know that you've you've continued to work with people all over in the world, marginalized communities in prisons, in schools. So why what drives you to keep doing that? I think it's uh, it feeds my. I have twenty eight books in so many languages, and I, I think a writer keeps trying to figure out how to keep his writing real. And some people get drunk, some people do coke, so other people do meth, some people womanize, some people buy brand new cars, some people, they want to be the top of their game, and they, they hire publicity managers, go on charge, every show you can imagine and stuff like that, right? What, keep, what, try to, what keeps it real for me is to stay in touch with the kids and the adults who, who have a, a love of learning. I mean, instantly, it, it triggers something in me when I see somebody who feverishly wants to know how to say to his daughter, I love you, but I can't say it. Tell me how to say I love you to my daughter, Jimmy, because I, the words I love you don't mean anything to me. There has to be a way I can tell her I love her. And then after six months of, of uh, reading and writing, that person goes and tells a story to his daughter that allows both of them to know how deeply the father loves her. Through a story, right? You can put all the grammatical corrections you want on somebody's shoulders, but it doesn't mean anything uh, if you can't convey what you want to to somebody. So you have to let you have to find out what's best for them. Let them tell their story the best way they can tell it to you to show how much they love you. If it's about fixing a car, let them tell you how much they spent three years fixing this '67 Chevy for you. And the day that you went to uh, Rio Grande High School, you got to drive it, Mejita. Did it drive good? Did, did it really, did it, the, the, the tuck and roll, that was the, the Chevy, oh man, the motor was impeccable? That's my love for you, Mejita. That's the way I say I love you. So make sure you, that car will never break down. It'll get you where you gotta go and you're going places, girl, you're going places. That's what I do for a living. Thank you so much mm. for coming and talking to us.